those of you who might be new to us today, we encourage everybody to bring their Bibles with you so that way you have something you can underline, make notes in, and keep with you uh, for a long time even after the sermon is done. And so uh, with that, if you have a Bible with you, we encourage you to open up to Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, verse 8. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Once again, our sermon verse is Mark chapter 16, verse 8. Or excuse me, verse 7. I am just all off today. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Sometimes it takes a lot of work to convince people that you're not dead. There was a plague that struck Great Britain a long time ago, and so terrifying was this plague, and so intense was this plague, that if you got it, it was pretty much assumed that you would die. A cough and a sneeze, and the next thing you know, you're in the grave. It was automatic, almost. And so it was that there were these cartmen that would take a cart and go through the villages, and they would collect the dead on nearly a daily basis. They would collect the dead on a daily basis. And so it goes that one day there was a man standing outside of his house with a corpse over his shoulder, and he heard the call of the cartman, bring out your dead, bring out your dead. And then as the cart drew near, he said, the man holding the corpse, here's one. And the cartman says, nine pence. And the man, the corpse over the man's shoulder says, I'm not dead. The cartman says, what was that? Nothing. Here's your nine pence. I'm not dead. There. He's not dead. I can't take him. And so the cartman and the man holding the corpse begin to argue over whether or not the man should be loaded onto the cart. Meanwhile, the corpse is saying, I'm not dead. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. I think I'll go for a walk today. I'm happy. I'm happy. Well, the cartman doesn't have time for this. He's on a schedule. He's a working man and a practical man. And so he just grabs a club and hits the corpse on the head, loads him onto the cart, and moves on. It's not just in Monty Python and the Holy Grail that it's hard to convince people that you're not dead. But it's also true of Jesus in today's gospel reading. Christ had already been raised by the time the women get to the tomb. The stone has been rolled away. And of course they're amazed to see that the stone has been rolled away and that the tomb is empty. That's not the kind of thing anybody would expect to see. In the ancient world, graves had two statuses. And those two statuses are the same statuses that they have today. A grave was either full or about to be. Rarely was a grave ever emptied of its contents. And if so, it would be grave robbers. But a resurrection like this? No, never, never. And so of course the women were amazed and shocked and scared whenever they looked into the tomb and not quite understanding what they were seeing. But inside the tomb, there was an angel sitting on the place where Jesus was once laid to rest, just sitting there. And he's dressed in white. And and this tells us two things. First of all, the angel sitting in the tomb means that the grave that held Jesus' body is clean. You see, in ancient Israelite law, If you had contact with a dead body, if you had contact with a corpse, that would make you unclean. And you would have to sit outside of the community and definitely not participate in worship until a priest declared you to be clean. But we know that Jesus' grave does not in fact hold a corpse, and it is in fact clean because an angel that otherwise sits in the presence of God himself is now sitting inside of the tomb. An angel wouldn't make himself unclean like that. So he has made his grave hollowed ground. But not only that, the second thing comes from the first point, is that we know that because Christ has been raised from the grave, that he's not going to be ashamed of your grave either. It means that he will come with his cleansing touch to clean out your grave one day, to raise you to new life. And that you will stand in the flesh just as he stood in the flesh. And this also means that if Jesus will raise you from the dead just like he was raised from the dead, it means that he's not ashamed of any of your sufferings that you face before death. 
Whether it is injury, illness, disease, addiction, grief, sorrow, or just repenting of every one of your sins and recognizing the messes that we have made. He does not turn his face away from you who believe in him. He is not ashamed by what you go through. And if he has been raised out of the grave, out of death, out of crucifixion for you, then we also know that no matter where we are or where we are laid to rest, you are not ever, ever beyond his power. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And even though we say this, and we say it often, sometimes it's hard for the joy of this to land in our hearts. It's hard for the veil of death that we see happening in the world time and time again to be lifted from before our eyes to really get into this and to really see it that Christ has indeed been raised. It's sort of like that time whenever I proposed to my wife. There I was bending down on one knee, holding up the ring in front of her, and she turns around and does not say, oh yes, I love you, thank you for asking, of course I'll take you to be my husband, my, my handsome man. No, she doesn't say that, no, no. No, she doesn't do that at all. I, I'm, I'm down there, on, you know, just kind of put myself out on, on one knee, holding up the ring, and she's like, are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious? As if I would say, no, now get in the car, loser. We've got to get back to the mall before it closes. This <laughs> ring has got to get returned. Another grave would have been filled that day. Right? Yeah, right. It's been nearly 2,000 years since Christ has been raised from the dead, and yet the joy land in our hearts. We let the way of the world dominate our beliefs, so much so that there are those who call themselves Christians but don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. There are those that call themselves Christians but don't believe that Jesus actually, in his body, rose from the dead. There are those who you ask, as a Christian, what is your hope? And they would simply tell you that my soul will go to heaven when I die. But that's not what the scriptures say. No. The scriptures tell us that because Christ rose from the dead, we will rise also. The scriptures also tell us that because Christ rose from the dead, the entire world will be made new. We will rise just like Jesus did. And so you heard it from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 in the epistle reading. He talked about the resurrection of Jesus as a matter of first importance. Why? Why would he call the resurrection of Jesus a matter of first importance? It's because if Christ did not rise from the dead, then you are still in your sins. But if he did rise from the dead, then you are forgiven. Plus, you also will be raised just like him. Paul also says in Romans chapter 6 that since we have been united in a death like his, we also will be united in a resurrection like his. Because he died, you die to sin. Because he rose, you will rise in your body to new life. And the scripture says that in many places. But not only that, but what about the world? What about the world? This world still belongs to God. Even though sin seems to cover everything. Even though tragedy happens often. Even though we wonder and question. This world still belongs to God. It was still, of course, created by him. Now, what kind of resurrection, what kind of salvation would it be if we only looked at this world and our bodies as a glorified escape hatch? As if when I die, then finally I can be free of this place and get out of the place that God can do nothing with. No. We are told in the scriptures that when Christ returns, he will restore all things. He will cast death and illness, and suffering, and warfare, and everything else that causes us sorrow, and everything else that is not originally a part of his creation, out. And he will raise us to eternal life, and we will stand on this world with him and before him. Jesus says it in Revelation 21, Behold, I am making all things new. And even the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament, centuries before these words were spoken by Christ, prophesied, that Jesus would say, Behold, I am making all things new. That's Isaiah 43, verse 8. And so the Bible tells us clearly that this resurrection, this empty tomb, means that you will rise from the dead. 
and you will stand on this earth, which will be made new and restored. The world belongs to him. What kind of king would he be if he retreated from it? What kind of victorious people would we be if we had to retreat from it? And our best hope was to get out. That's not victory. And thanks be to God, that's not what Jesus gives you on this day. We oftentimes stare at, at tombstones and we lay our flowers at gravesides and we, we place our, our hands on the stones and we talk to the people who have gone before wishing they could hear our words. And sadly, the resurrection of Jesus doesn't necessarily or automatically take away the grief and suffering that we might feel in our hearts, especially on days like today. But yet, when we look to the tomb, we see our light. That because one particular tomb happened to give up Jesus' body, it means that death has lost its grip on all who live in Christ. It means that while we also shed our tears and say our words of remembrance and lay our flowers at gravesides, we can also say this, and we should, death, you don't have much longer. It will not always be like this. One day, it's going to be different because my Lord has been raised and he is my light. Alleluia, Christ is risen. And if we struggle still with this idea that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and and, and we come here Sunday after Sunday and we still don't get it, and and we wrestle with this one resurrection, how much more will we wrestle with the reality when we are raised from the dead? I imagine that when we are raised from the dead on that last day when Christ returns and our graves are emptied, we will stand there and probably it will take a long time for the joy to settle in. I can imagine two people standing next to each other at the grave punching one another, saying, hey, did you feel that? Oh, you're real too. Now hit me. Okay, I'm real too. If only there could be like a photo booth like they have at whenever you come off the roller coaster. So that way you could see your face whenever you're raised from the grave. <laughs> you could hold that onto that picture for forever if you'd like. It's yours. It'd be free. <laughs> but the disciples, of course, struggled as well. And as we read through the Gospel of Mark, the rest of this chapter, Mark 16, we find this vein of unbelief that continues to go throughout the rest of the story. Even though Christ has been raised, even though they hear the angel announcement and the women see that the tomb is empty. Look at verse 8. As you get to verse 8, it says this in Mark chapter 16. The women who had seen the angel and saw the tomb was empty and heard the message, verse 8 says, they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. But that's fine. Jesus will go and he'll find Mary Magdalene and show himself to her later on in this chapter. And she will believe that he has been raised. And she will go and tell the disciples. And the disciples still won't believe. (laughs) But that's okay. Jesus will then appear later on in this chapter to two of his disciples as they're walking along the road. And he will reveal that he has been raised from the dead. And they'll believe. And then he'll go, they'll go and tell the rest of the disciples. And The disciples still won't believe. And then, finally, Jesus will appear to all of his disciples when they are gathered together, show himself to them, rebuke them for their unbelief, but then they will finally believe that Christ has been raised from the dead. When we disbelieve this message, then we do stand to deserve a rebuke from Jesus for not believing his word and not trusting it. However, this actually highlights the patience and love of Jesus as well. He could have just been raised from the tomb to new life and gone up to heaven. He doesn't need you to believe in him in order for him to be Lord. He doesn't need you to believe in him in order for him to be Lord. He is Lord. We can do nothing about that to change that one way or the other. But instead, he does rise from the grave. He appears to his disciples again and again, and again. And they need that confirmation again, and again, and again. Jesus will have his tomb open, and the women will look in and see that it's empty. And then as we read the other Gospels, we find Peter and John also run to the tomb and look in and find that it's empty. Jesus will appear to his disciples multiple times as well. In order that they might finally believe, he is patient, he will teach, he will show, 
He will present himself before them again and again so that the work that he started in them might be completed. They would believe that he has been raised from the dead. And so you can expect to find it just as he said. The disciples heard Jesus say that he would be handed over, that he would suffer, he would die, he would rise, and he did. The disciples heard him say that for a little while they would see him again, and then they would see him no longer. And so Christ rose, appeared, and then ascended to God's right hand, and they no longer saw him, just as he said. He told his disciples that he would make them fishers of men, and he fulfilled that promise by sending them out to the ends of the earth to preach and administer the sacraments. And so he did that too. He told them he wouldn't be alone, they wouldn't be alone, and so he sent the Holy Spirit. Everything that he has said, he has done. And so when Jesus tells you that he is your child through the waters of holy ba- or that you are God's child through the waters of holy baptism, you are. When Jesus tells you that this is his body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins at this table, it is, and it is for you. And when Jesus tells you that he is going to return one day and raise you all from the dead who believe in him and bring you into eternal life, and then you will know for real the great and deep and unfathomable joy that is ahead, you can believe that he will. Sometimes a father, whenever he's angry with his children because he's told them to do something for the tenth time, says, I'm not going to tell you again. And I see some of you shudder because I just brought back painful memories. I'm not going to tell you again. Well, one day Jesus won't tell us again either, but it won't be a dark moment. It won't be a moment of aggravation. It'll be a moment of true joy. Here, he will stand right before your eyes where you can see him and his flesh-filled finger will wipe away every tear from your eye. And we believe him now, but you can also believe that that's going to take a little while for the true joy of that moment to deeply settle into our hearts. But that's okay. We'll have forever. And we'll find it just as he said. Amen.